this is a little thing that they added on the hill behind the, the gardens in the back. And I have no idea what that is. And we walk through it, we still have no idea what it is. They've got a little cafeteria in there where you can buy really expensive food that's not very good. <laughs> now this is the nice thing about the view. This is the view from up there. So here's the palace, there's Vienna, there's the gardens, and you go up this hill and there's this pretty fountain and then this structure, whatever it is. But you get a nice view of Vienna from there. Here's a Schoenbrunn Palace, kind of a copy of, of Versailles. You know, all palaces in Europe try to copy Versailles, so they're always, you know, they're always in that vein. But uh, you guys don't know Sam Maskett, but Sam Maskett's a, a surgeon from Southern California who knows wine and knows museums and all, and his response to Schoenbrunn is, well, once you've seen Versailles, nothing looks as good. So, it's, so, but it was kind of a nice palace once you're there. And then this is as you go up into here, and as I said, there's a little cafeteria up there, so not much exciting going on. But I do like the, you know, the guardians here, the, you know, eagles with armor and shields that are there guarding the place. Okay, so, Catherine. This is an intern question. What do onions, ogres, and retinas have in common? Layers. Layers, exactly. They all have <coughs> layers. And so we're going to sit and spend a little bit of time on the retinal layers because it's really important that you recognize each of the layers of the retina and what they do and why they're important. So first off, we're looking at a, at a picture here of the retina and just a, a brief definition. To the pathologists, you know, what is the definition of the macula to a pathologist? Oh, it's the um, region between the arcades. Okay, that's the definition of the macula to a retina doctor. Okay. What's the definition to a pathologist? Um, it's where, um, I think the ganglion cell layer only has, is only, is thicker. Exactly. So to a pathologist, the definition of a macula is where the ganglion cell layer is more than one cell layer thick. But fortunately, it pretty much corresponds to the area inside the arcade. So the definition that retina doctors use and pathologists use are, are pretty much the same. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk a little bit about layers of the retina. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to go and start naming them. So I just want to go around the room. So this is the vitreous. What's this layer right here? Okay, and here? Layer. Good. Here? Layer. All right. There? Okay. Here? Good. There? Outer plexiform layer. There? Outer nuclear layer. Here? Photoreceptor layer. Okay. And last but not least, back to Catherine. Uh, the RPE. All right. Exactly. So those are all the layers <coughs> of the retina. So when you're Talking about the retina, you can talk about the anatomic layers, but you can also talk about, you know, how a photon of light comes through and how it's processed and what it does. And so I think we can kind of go ahead and, and do that two ways. So when we look at a close-up of the retina here, let's, let's trace a photon of light. So a photon of light is interesting. It has to come through the retina. And so you know, to me, the retina is, is kind of designed upside down. It's weird because if I were designing something, I'd have the photoreceptors out where the light comes through, and it wouldn't have to go through the retina. But what's critically important is photoreceptors are amazingly active cells, and they take a lot of metabolism. And so the reason why the photoreceptors are clear down here is because they have to be close to the choroid where they attain their nourishment. So that's why the retina is kind of inside out, if you will, or upside down. So a photon of light comes through, a photon of light hits one of these areas here in the outer segments, and when you guys do retina, you'll see what these look like on EM. They look like a little stack of coins. And so the membrane is right there, and you've got all the rhodopsin that's there, and so a photon of light hits that rhodopsin, it switches from cis to trans, it changes the, the potential in the membrane, and it starts a hyperpolarization. So it starts a polarization wave going. And so then that transfers here, and it goes to the outer nuclear layer, which is where it is. And then the axon comes here, and then 
Uh, where does the axon link up? Or what cell does the axon link up to? We'll just keep going around. The bipolar cells. Okay, so it links up to a bipolar cell. And the bipolar cell body is here in the inner nuclear layer. And the axon goes out here. And then what does it link up to? The ganglion cells. Okay, so it, it links up to a ganglion cell. The ganglion cell layer body is right here in the ganglion cell. Okay, and then the axon leaves that ganglion cell. And where does that axon eventually synapse? chiasm and then back through the radiations and then um, I think it's finally at the um, lateral geniculate body. Exactly. So this is a really long axon. It comes all the way from that ganglion cell to the lateral geniculate body. And so that's a really long axon. And the problem is, is anywhere that's interrupted, anywhere along that, can eventually cause death to that cell. And so all the way from the lateral geniculate body forward, all the way to the uh, ganglion cell nucleus. It can cause problems there. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk a little bit about what's in each cellular layer and, and kind of what each, each layer does. And so now we're going to start from in to out. So, internal limiting membrane. What is the internal limiting membrane? Exactly. So it's really not a membrane like a basement membrane, but the little Mueller cells have their foot plates on there, and it's kind of a separation between the vitreous and the retinous. So we call it the internal limiting membrane, but it's really not a, a true membrane itself. All right. And then where are we in the eye right now? Uh, so this looks like we're in the macula. Yeah, true that... question. We're in the macula. Why? Exactly, because the ganglion cell layer is multiple cell layers thick right here. So that tells us that we're actually in the macula right here. Now, this is an interesting cellular layer here, the inner nuclear layer. Now, the inner nuclear layer not only has the bipolar cells that we talked about, but what other cells live in the inner nuclear layer? Um, so we have the apocrine cells. Apocrine cells, another one? Uh, Mueller cells. Mueller cells, and the last one? Well, amacrine, I'm sorry, I heard amacrine. It should have been amacrine, not apocrine cells, but yeah. amacrine. Amacrine. Oh. Amacrine. I'm not sure that's that one. Horizontal cells, horizontal cells. So this is a very busy cellular layer because not only do you have the bipolars, which link it vertically, if you will, but you've got amacrine and horizontal cells, which kind of run horizontally. They're very interesting cells because they've got their little processes go all over the place. And we think that this is the beginning of where visual processing takes place. And so, you know, if you think about it simplistically, you say, okay, well, one, you know, photon comes in and triggers one rod, and then it goes through the lateral geniculate body. But there is processing going on even in the inner nuclear layer. And already it's starting to, you know, do on-off signals and process it. And so when people are talking about putting little chips kind of on the surface of the retina and eventually connecting it to the brain. It's a lot more complicated than that. And the interconnections between the horizontal and the amacrine cells are amazing. Helga Kolb, who's one of our PhDs here, who's now emeritus, um, she, she won the Proctor Prize for her work on this. She spent a career looking at how these are all interconnected and has some amazing EM showing it. So very, very complex. Mueller cells, what the heck do they do? Um, I think they're... They're kind of like scavenger cells or microglial cells. Okay, so they're glia microglial cells, so they do scavenge, but they also give some structural support because do the, their cell bodies live in here, but their little processes go all the way up here and all the way down here, which is interesting. So, and one last little area right here, people sometimes <coughs> call this the outer limiting membrane right here with the, here's the cell bodies of the rods and cones and then their inner and outer segments the heck is the outer limiting membrane? Mm -hmm. I think it's the other end of the microglial cells. Sorry, microglial. What exactly forms it right here? These are actually little tiny junctions. And so when you look at the junctions in light microscopy, it almost looks like it's a membrane. So you may hear some people say outer limiting membrane. It's not a membrane, it's the little junction in the inner segments of the cells right there that form those little dots that looks like a membrane. Okay, so now we want to talk 
about this area right here. And I guess we'll just keep going. Gosh, what area is, is this? Now we're in the fovea. Okay. So the retina does kind of part a little bit in the fovea because the fovea is the part of the macula that gives us our fine vision. And so it really does thin out here such that the light doesn't have to pass through the entire retina, but just that part of the retina, and then it, it hits right here. Now, what kind of cells are predominant in the outer part of the fovea? What are the cones? Cones, exactly. So the, the um, center of the fovea is very, very cone rich. And the reason why you get a lot of fine vision at the fovea is when you look at the fovea, one um, cone is attached to one ganglion cell and then goes back. So it's a one to one to one ratio. And so because of that, you want to part the area to let the light come through. So all these ganglion cells get stacked up way over here. And so this, rod, this cone right here may link up to a ganglion cell right there, and because of that, the fibers right here tend to run in a more oblique <coughs> manner. And I was hoping to show this nicely here. Well, you kind of get the idea. See those fibers running obliquely a little bit right there? And so, you know, you have to have all those ganglion cells stacked up on the side, and the fibers run obliquely. What is this layer called right here? Henley's layer. layer. Okay, and why is that important? Uh, when you have CME, you get that flower petal looking up here. Exactly. So that's where when you have cystoid macular edema, that's where the edema forms and you get that flower petal is because this layer of Henley is the fibers going obliquely to get connected to those ganglion cells to go back. Now the peripheral retina is a little bit different. The peripheral retina, you may have a hundred rods hook up to one single ganglion cell. And the reason why we do that is why does, why does nature do that? Because you want more spatial awareness. Um, yeah, areas exactly. So it summates. It summates. And so if you're ever out on a, on a, you know, like you're out on a night and it's dark and then you see a light out here and then you look at it, the light disappears. And that's not uncommon that you see that. And so it's because it summates out here. Now that's important because Teleologically, you know, you're out climbing through the tundra, you know, you want to see that saber-toothed tiger that's going to try to eat you, you know, and so you want to be able to see things in the periphery, and so the way nature does that is it gets summation. So you may have a hundred rods going into a single cone, and that'll show you movement, it'll show you little lights out there, whereas the cones in the center are one-to-one -one because that's your fine vision, that's your reading, that's your facial recognition, that's your fine vision. So a little bit different the way the retina is wired. Okay, now we want to talk about some specific pathologic entities that can affect the retina. So we'll go to, uh, Chris, what are we looking at right here? Uh, this is a fundus photo here. We see um, a lot of hemorrhages here. So we see hemorrhages, um, looks like pretty much in all layers. So we see hemorrhages uh, uh, more superficially. So we see these kind of flame-shaped hemorrhages. And we also see some deeper, looks like little dot and blot hemorrhages. And then over the macula, we see it looks like some exit aid over here. Okay, so what do you think this could be? Uh, so, I mean, there's certain things, lots of things can do this. I mean, hypertension can do this, bad diabetes can look something like this, but hypertension is probably the most common thing. So exactly, you can get hypertension, look like this, but remember, diabetes can look like this too. Why are superficial hemorrhages more flame-shaped? Because uh, they're in that nerve fiber layer. Exactly, so that nerve fiber layer, you know, that leaves the ganglion cell and then it turns perpendicular to the surface, you know, as it, or actually parallel to the surface as it runs into the um, optic nerve. And so hemorrhages that are superficial tend to have that flame shape. Hemorrhages that are deeper tend to be more dot and blot. But if you look right here, you can see that there are both dot, blot, flame hemorrhages, some macular exudate, even maybe a little bit of ischemia right here. And so a good guess would be hypertension. And so this was a patient that, that came in, actually a younger person came in, and they had severe, severe hypertension. And it was interesting because they were seen in triage and they looked and said, oh, you know, I don't know, maybe this is, you know, central retinal vein occlusion or something. And then, you know, we were looking at it, scratching our heads, saying, hmm, what could this be? And this was when the student said, well, did anybody check their blood pressure? So, of course, we had to find a blood pressure cuff. We checked it, it was 200 over 100. And so, off to the ER they went. And so this is severe hypertensive retinopathy. Now, what else could happen with hypertensive retinopathy? Uh, Brad? 
-hmm. the heck is going on right here? Um, so it looks like some hard exudates. Okay. And then you have, have some like uh, hemorrhages coming off of the disc as well, flame-shaped hemorrhages. Now, why are the exudates this kind of star shape? Um, so exudates usually indicate prior uh, edema, and so like maybe some residual edema or... Like, why are they star-shaped though? Probably because of the layer that they're in. Which is? Uh, I would say nerve fiber layer. Nope, it's, they're actually deeper in Henley's layer. Oh, and so okay. you can see just like the flower petal for cystoid macular edema, when you've got this hard exudate, so hard exudate is protein rich, it's lipid rich, <coughs> you know, you've got leakage of fluid and then the fluid eventually gets reabsorbed, but the stuff, you know, the, the proteins, the lipid end up staying there. So you get these yellowish hard exudate. And the star shape is, is just indicative that it's in the macula. Now, if you look real carefully, uh, Mike, what's going on right here in the optic nerve? There's some disc margin blurring, so probably some, I guess we can't technically call it papilledema, but disc edema. Or exactly, so be careful, because papilledema by definition is increased pressure, you know, or a swelling of the optic nerve due to increased cerebral spinal fluid pressure. And so technically you can get in severe hypertension, you can even get some swelling of the disc in hypertension. So you end up getting some disc swelling there, and that's what you're seeing there, is some disc swelling. Let's go back one. And this is a severe case, and so this is a patient who had severe hypertension, and you can see that almost looks like papilledema. There's some ischemia here, there's some tortuosity of the vessels, there's these hemorrhages around here, and so in a severe hypertensive crisis, you can even get uh, swelling of the optic nerves. All right, what are we seeing right here, Tina? Okay, so that's the left eye, and it's really quite striking kind of the degree of pallor just diffusely through the whole macula. And then looking at the fovea, you look like you have a cherry red spot in the middle. So we'd be concerned about a central <coughs> retinal artery occlusion here. Okay, so this is a classic central retinal artery occlusion. Why do you get a cherry red spot? Um, it just the the pallor of the outside compared to the pigment in the macula creates that appearance rather it's than not, it actually tr truly being more red in the yeah it's not even so I mean? much so much the the you know the pigment in there but it's the fact that that you're actually kind of seeing through toward the choroid we still have decent it's blood it. supply in the fovea and of course the retina itself is all swollen so it turns white so this is the classic central retinal artery occlusion now are arteries more embolic or are they more thrombotic? Uh, they tend to be more embolic. More embolic. So when you see someone with a central retinal artery, you want to look for clots coming from somewhere, cholesterol coming from somewhere. You, know, you want to have them worked up for their carotids, for their aortic arch, even for their valves in the heart. And so these are usually more embolic, and that's the classic central retinal artery occlusion. Catherine, what are we seeing here? Here you see a more <clears throat> focal area of the, the whitening of the ischemia and also perhaps like a cotton wool spot as well. Okay, so maybe a little cotton wool spot. Focal, what does that mean? Uh, like a branch artery occlusion. Exactly. So this is a branch artery occlusion rather than a central artery occlusion. So this would be one where this one of these arterioles gets blocked off right there and you get this focal area of ischemia corresponding to it. So it's the same process, it's usually embolic, but it's in, it's further downstream, and so it hasn't blocked off the entire central retinal artery, it's blocked off one of its branches, so this is a branch retinal artery occlusion. And what are we showing right here? This is a vessel with a lot of plaque in it, um, in, in the optic nerve. All right, so which vessel is this? Exactly, so we're actually in the optic nerve, and what I wanted to show you is the central retinal artery shares a common adventitial sheath with the central retinal vein. And so look at that artery, look at all of that cholesterol and lipid and all, all those crown burgers and moochies and all that good food that we eat, you know. And uh, so you vegetarians, your arteries don't look this way, so you guys should feel very, very good about this. 
So look how narrow the lumen is there. And so you don't usually get a central artery occlusion in a nice, normal, wide artery. And so it's usually been narrowed from arterial sclerosis, and then it's more susceptible to a little clot forming or a little emboli forming. But also, look at that artery, that big, thickened, juicy artery is pushing next to the vein next to it. So this is why we always say the most common cause of a central artery occlusion is arterial sclerosis. The most common cause of a central vein occlusion is arterial sclerosis because that sclerotic artery kind of pushes on the vein next to it can lead to stasis which can then lead to a central retinal vein occlusion. All right, so what am I, what am I showing here? I guess Vaish. Um, so you're showing that the, um, there's marked atrophy in the um, inner, uh, inner retina, so that's most likely due to um, central retinal artery occlusion or some sort of ischemia. So when you look at the blood supply of the retina, tell me how it's divided. How's the blood supply of the retina divided? So the inner two-thirds is supplied by the retinal vasculature and the outer third is um, comes from the choroid. And so you kind of divide at the uh, outer plexiform layer. Um, that's kind of where you mark off between the two. Well, what you see right here exactly at the inner two-thirds roughly of the retina receive this blood supply from sentinel retinal artery, the outer third from the choroid. So if you look right here, the choroid's still intact here and that outer third is, is still intact, but the inner two-thirds is wiped out. And so it, there's still a tiny bit of the outer nuclear layer that gets its blood supply from the choroid. So there's a little bit of the outer nuclear layer, but the inner nuclear layer, ganglion cell layer, totally wiped out. So this is a central retinal artery occlusion. All right, what are we looking at right here? Okay. Um, lots of blood. So it looks like, and it's got a, some vessels that are uh, kind of white as well, like inferiorly. So it looks like the blood and thunder retina from like a CRVO. Exactly. So this is a little bit different than the central, well, a lot different than central retinal artery occlusion, which is pale and ischemic. This is where everything's backed up. So, you know, you're driving in the snowstorm and there's a wreck on the freeway, you know, everything gets backed up. And so central retinal vein occlusion, you get backup of blood in all four quadrants all the way around, and they call this the blood and thunder. I don't know what thunder means, but the blood and thunder retina, it just sounds cool. Blood and thunder. And so, um, Rachel, what is this one right here? Branch retinal vein occlusion. What's the most common cause of a branch retinal vein occlusion? Usually it's arterial venous leaking, like the, the compression from the, um, like from the AV crossover. Exactly. So if you look at this arterial, look at that. They call that silver wiring. And so that's actually even a sclerotic arterial right there. And so right where the venule, where the arterial, or the, the venule crosses over the artery, you'll get some thinning and some sausaging of that vein, and then eventually that vein will occlude and you'll get that focal branch vein occlusion. So it's usually right at the crossing point where the arterial and the vein will cross over. So, but again, it's, it's arterial sclerosis here. Look at that silver wiring there. So it's arterial sclerosis that causes it. And this is just an eye that's been cut in half sagittally, and you can see that it will cover all four quadrants. So it goes all the way from the optic nerve to the aura serrata. So central retinal artery, or central retinal vein occlusion will do all the quadrants and you'll just get that backup of blood throughout all the layers. And this just shows it pathologically. You can see the blood in all layers of the retina. Now eventually you can get some shut vessels start to form. You can start to drain that out. And so when you get remote from a central retinal vein occlusion, the hemorrhage will eventually reabsorb, and it's, it's almost like uh, you know when there's a crash on the freeway, you know you get off and you take the side streets and eventually get around the crash, and that's what the blood does too. And sometimes you'll even see 
little shunt vessels on the surface of the, ret of the optic nerve as that blood finds different ways to get out of there in a central retinal vein occlusion. Um, what do we see in next here? Uh, yeah, so similar to what the last picture I saw. So this is um, colorblind as photo, uh, right eye. So here we see um, a lot of exudate in the macula. We see hemorrhages again. Um, there's some flame stage, some look a little bit deeper. And then we see, it looks like cotton wool spots probably there inferiorly as well. So what else could this be? What's the most common finding, the most common disease for this finding? Yeah, so uh, again, diabetes would probably be the most common. Hypertension, like an eye picture, can also look like this, but diabetes is pretty common. So diabetes is common and unfortunately becoming more and more common. And so as our society eats more and more cheeseburgers and, and moochies, um, obesity has become a huge problem. And as a result, diabetes has become a huge problem. So type two diabetes is just exploding now. And so even I'm, I'm just a general ophthalmologist, I see probably five diabetics in a half day every single day. I mean, there's just tons of diabetics now. So you're gonna see this more and more and more. So first of all, how do we subdivide diabetic retinopathy? Uh, so we, uh, proliferative and non-proliferative. Okay, what's another word for non-proliferative? Uh, Some people call it background. So when you hear the term background retinopathy, that's non-proliferative. Now remember, there is an entity kind of in between people will call pre-proliferative. All right, so when we're looking at background retinopathy or <coughs> non-proliferative retinopathy, what am I looking at right here? I guess, Brad, what are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at um, some, what appears to be like uh, microaneurysms. Exactly, so this is a, a trypsin digest. This is where you put in a material that digest the tissue around the blood vessels, and then you can get a view of just the blood vessels. So this is a microaneurysm. So that's the first thing that we think happens. The pericytes, you know, are damaged from the ischemia and from the diabetes, and then eventually they drop out and you'll get these little microaneurysms. You know, these microaneurysms make the vessel wall weaker. They also make it so it leaks a little bit. So in addition to the microaneurysms, you get dot hemorrhages, blot hemorrhages, even flame hemorrhages. Mike, what are we showing right here? Um, so you have flame hemorrhages, dot blood hemorrhages, exudates, and especially right there in the macula, you just have a, a big patch of heart exudate. Exactly, so now once we've got heart exudate in the macula, you can imagine that's not really conducive for good vision. So we really wanna to try to do what we can to prevent this from happening. Now you can't really laser that because you get damage some people have talked about the possibility of even using anti-VEGF to try to get this to dry up and go away. Steroids can sometimes help to get this to go away, but boy, once you get all that hard exudate in there, I mean, that's really not conducive to good vision, so you really want to treat it before it gets to the point where you get the severe hard exudate. And you can see this is a path specimen of the retina, and this is the hard exudate here. So if you analyze that, it's very protein rich, it's very lipid rich, and that's why it's yellow because of the lipid. So this is the hard exudate that you can get. Boy, that's not a very good, well, Tina, what am I, what am I trying to show right here? Um, are those cotton wool spots? Cotton wool spots, and what are cotton wool spots? The ischemia of the uh, nerve fiber layer. All right, so it's an area of focal ischemia, and so if you look, this is actually not blood here. These are actually swollen ganglion cells here in the nerve fiber layer. So when you get focal ischemia, you'll get swelling there. Now the cotton wool spots will eventually go away, but it's not because, you know, that's because the swelling goes away. But once that axon gets ischemic and gets permanently damaged, it dies off. So if you were able to do little pinpoint ERGs, you would find focal areas of disruption where areas of big cotton wool spots were. So focal ischemia here of the ganglion cells, nerve fiber layer, is the hallmark. And here's a picture of it. These are actually swollen ganglion cells here in the nerve fiber layer. So that's why it looks like cotton wool on the surface of the IOL. I mean, surface, sorry, of the, <laughs> of the retina. Sorry, IOL's on my brain. Uh, and so it kind of obscures the retinal tissue underneath it, so that's why it looks like this white, fluffy, you know, cotton on the surface. All right, what are we seeing, what are we seeing right here? Um, it's like a lot of diffuse 
reduce hemorrhage, and then also some exudates at the, towards the inferior portion, and then some a lot of dilated torturous vessels. What is, what's going on right here? Um, looks like um, some neovascularization, some new vessel forming. So what do we call this? A proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Okay, and then more specific? Um, How do we subdivide the neovascularization? Um, it's either in the disc or elsewhere. Exactly. So we kind of crudely divide it into NVD, neovascularization of the disc, and NVE, neovascularization elsewhere. And so here's the neovascularization elsewhere. And then, of course, we have the NVD, neovascularization of the disc. And so this is like, remember... Greek mythology, Medusa, the, who had all the snakes coming out of her head. So this is a Medusa disc. And so you can see all of the abnormal blood vessels there growing out of the disc. So what's the, what's the underlying etiology for NVD or NVE? In ischemic uh, retina, that's um, using a lot of uh, VEGF and promoting, trying to create vessels to bring more oxygen to the area. Exactly. So you get chronic ischemia, and then the reaction is, through various mediators, one of which is VEGF, is to get new blood vessels to grow. The problem with these blood vessels is they're not competent blood vessels. They don't have good parasites around them. They leak like crazy. And so one of the applications that you can run into is you can run into this. What is... Exactly. So those vessels can leak, you get hemorrhage, you get gliosis going on, you get scarring, you get tractional retinal detachments. And then what's going on here? So this is a large pre-retinal uh, boat-shaped hemorrhage. Uh, you're also seeing some more hard exudates superiorly and then um, other hemorrhages as well. So you can see this is a boat-shaped hemorrhage. What? Why is that? Right, so it's between kind of the hyaloid face, they call it. So between the posterior vitreous and the retina, you'll actually get hemorrhaging. So on the top here, you just get a fluid layer. And then, of course, it's kind of shaped like a boat here. And so that's pre-retinal, but between the retina and the vitreous. So it hasn't broken through to the vitreous yet. It's in the layer in between. You can see the neovascularization right here. This is another complication of this neovascularization. What are we looking at right here? Okay, so look at all those vessels. So we, we, so we call this condition rubiosus iridis, you know, literally red iris. So we used to call it when it's bad like this ropiosus because, you know, it looks like those big, big red ropes in there. But so this is severe rubiosus iridis, neovascularization of the iris. And again, it's a response to chronic ischemia. And that ischemia can even cause this now. So the most common cause of rubiosis is, is, you know, diabetic retinopathy. What's another cause? Uh, <coughs> it causes ischemia, you can do it. So okay. CRVO can do it. Yep. CRVO is second. What would be third? Just ocular ischemic syndrome is kind of the third thing. So think about it. If they have severe ischemia to the eye itself, you know, say they had severe carotid disease, they had three muscle, you know, muscle surgery and took away all the, you know, blood from the anterior segment. And so chronic ischemia inside the eye can cause the neovascularization on the surface of the iris. And as we talked about last week, you know, when we looked at the, the you know, causes of glaucoma, Here's the abnormal blood vessels on the surface of the iris. What is going on right there? Um, I guess Brad, you're next. You're hiding um, behind my yeah, sorry. Sorry. Um So you have kind of the uvea um, coming into your, to the iris, so the ectropion uvea. So they call it ectropion uvea. It says that neovascularization on the surface of the iris contracts a little bit. It literally pulls that pigment epithelium on the posterior surface as kind of around the corner of the pupil and bends it around. So you see a little dark area around the edge of the pupil, ectropia and uvia. And again, as we showed last week, 
these vessels can grow into the angle and cause secondary angle closure. And there you see, here's the iris plastered against the peripheral cornea, closing off that angle. Now, what else, uh, Mike, what else happens to the iris here in chronic diabetics? Um, so that just looks like the pigmented epithelial layer. Uh, there's just like some um, vacuoles in it. Exactly. So you get from the chronic ischemia, you get what they call lacy vacuolization. Now, again, they love showing obscure path pictures on boards, and so this is one that they'll often put on there. So you can get lacy vacuolization of the, of the um, iris pigment epithelium. Tina, what are we showing right here? Um, so, let's see what would be abnormal here. First of all, what, what part of the eye are we looking at? Ciliary body. Absence of. Take a step back. What kind of stain is this? Oh, this is a stain of the basement membrane. So. What stain is that? Um. This would be. Um, oh my goodness. Okay, so it's PAS. Yeah, stain. The yeah, IS stains, so stains basement membranes. Why would we be showing you one of those of the ciliar body? So this is another finding in, in diabetic eyes with the thickening of the basement membrane in the ciliary body. Exactly. So this is a PAS stain for basement membrane. Look at that thick one. And so when I was, a, I did a pre-residency fellow like you guys, fellowship like you guys are doing with Dave Apple. And so he, you know, the, the American board said, we need some path pictures from you. And so David were always like, shove it off on me. See, I learned that from him. And so he said, Nick, go, go, take some good pictures, send it to these guys. So I said, okay, here's a good picture. I took a nice picture of ciliar body, PAS, basement membrane thickening, send it to them. And so I'm taking boards now, you know, five years later, and I sit down and sure enough, there is my picture on the board exam, you know, saying what it is. And I said, oh man, that's my picture. I'm so smart, diabetic. Great, so now what you guys will learn when you take your OCAPs is that there are no one-part questions, there's two-part questions. So they show you this, you say, ah, diabetic, man, I'm smart, I've got this nailed. And then question A is, a patient with this would have a glomerular filtration rate of, <laughs> your perineal nerve velocity of, and so, you know, yeah, you know their kidneys are failing, you know their nerves don't work well, but shoot, what's the real number? So. Again, two-part question, you may know the answer and still don't get it right. So that's so don't feel bad when you walk out of OCAPs and say, oh my God, I missed all of them, because you always feel that way. All right, how do we treat proliferative diabetic retinopathy? Um, you can um, use anti-VEGF intravitreal injections. Okay, what is this? What is the older way to treat it? Uh, it looks like um, PRP or some type of laser to okay. scar down the ischemic part of the retina. So when the, the lasers first came out, the very first laser wasn't an, an argon laser, it was a xenon arc laser. And my, my program was so, you know, so much in ancient times that our VA, we still had one of these in the back. And it was like as big as a whole closet. And it would put these thousand micron spots and it would just sizzle the tissue. And so when these first came out, people were saying, well, we're gonna take the laser and we're gonna treat those, you know, that neovascularization and that'll make it go down. And so they were actually taking xenon arc lasers and blasting the neovascularization on the disc. And so this is one of the first things my predecessor Dave Apple did in the 60s is they looked at the pathology and they said, wait a minute, you're killing off the nerve fiber layer. You're actually you know, blinding the patient by doing the laser. But at the same time, they were the people would come in with extensive NVE and so they take this laser and they blast the peripheral retina, and then they'd say, okay, come back next month and we'll you know, blast the optic nerve, and they'd come back the next month and the vessels on the nerve would have regressed. And so finally people said, well, wait a minute, maybe if we treat the periphery, we can save the center. And that was the whole idea, is you do panretinal photocoagulation of the peripheral retina. First off, it, it kills off ischemic retina, but it also, 
you know, makes these laser spots, it allows more oxygen to flow through, and the proliferation on the disc would shrink down and go away. And so you do panretinal peripheral photocoagulation to make the neovascularization of the disc go away. And now, of course, we can do anti-VEGF injections and do the same thing. And here you see, here's an actual laser spot. So now we use argon laser. The argon laser works by being absorbed by the pigment of the RPE. So here's RPE here, here's RPE. Here's a laser spot here, and it's absorbed by the RPE pigment. It kind of kills that off. It kind of kills off some ischemic retina and it lets more oxygen flow from the choroid into the retina. So again, you treat the peripheral retina in order to save the center. What the heck are we looking at right here? So it's an FA, looks like, yeah, maybe peripheral retina. Um, and then the ends of the vessels have these like fronds of neovascularization there. Yeah, you look beyond it. Boy, and that's not a film artifact. That's just dark beyond there. What could this be? So, uh, fronds could be like sickle cell disease. Exactly. And so these are what they call sea fans. You know, if you've seen the pictures of, you know, Jacques Cousteau diving and you see these sea fans, that's what they look like. And so you've got these fronds here, and beyond that, there's no good blood vessels. So you get focal ischemia kind of wiping out peripheral retina. And then again, it tries to make new blood vessels to go across that. And so this attempts to be a sickle cell patient. So sickle cell will do that. You can get a weird disease. Again, they love asking this on boards. Eels, Eels disease. Again, it's, it's something that you see actually in Southeast Asia, in South Asia. And you'll get, again, this peripheral ischemia with these C fans trying to grow across it. And this just shows you this is a patient with sickle cell. And you can see the knobbiness of the vessels there because when the, when the cells <coughs> sickle, they'll clump up in that area and then you get focal areas of ischemia. So you don't see much sickle cell here in Utah because uh, you know a lot of Utahns are, are Caucasian, but you see a lot of this in areas with a high African American population. You'll see a lot of sickle cell. All right, so now we're looking, I guess, okay, yeah. Vaish, what are we looking um, at here? So looking at the macular, there's a macular hole there with like there's a little bit of surrounding um, edema as well. Right? Exactly. So you see that's a full thickness macular hole and there's a little bit of edema around it. And here you can see a close-up of that. What is this thing right here? Pointer? Exactly. That's a fixation rod. You know, so I've had people say, oh man, it's a fold in the retina there. And it's like, that's just something, because you know, this central, if you have a full thickness hole, your vision drops to like 2200. And so it's hard for them to fixate, and so this is actually fixation rod in there. And so you see full thickness hole, but there's a cuff of edema around it. So sometimes, even if it's a full thickness hole, if you can get it to seal off um, surgically, you can sometimes get that fluid to go down, and, and the scotoma will shrink a little bit. So here's the edge of a full thickness hole. Here's some edema next to it. What do we think the cause of full thickness holes are, or just macular holes in general? It's actually focal vitreoretinal retinal traction. So when you do the surgery, you have to do a vitrectomy, peel off any traction, then you put gas in their eye, and then these poor patients have to you know, sit face down for like seven to 10 days. It's just awful. But eventually, if you can get it to seal off, their vision will improve. All right, what are we looking at right here? So there's a, um, looks like the uh, vessels are slightly distorted. Uh, Centrally near the macula, and there might a bit of ring. Maybe these yeah. vessels are kind of curvy yeah. there. Maybe they're pulled yeah. here. Maybe a slight sheen, kind of that you know, kind of. What do you think um, this could be? Could be an epiretinal membrane. Exactly. So this is an epiretinal membrane. Now this one's a little bit more prominent. You can see it here. This would be one that maybe even an intern could see. You know, <laughs> so here you can see that you've got all this wrinkling here, and so this is an epiretinal membrane. And then again, we've got a fixation line. This happens to be a red free picture, and this just kind of highlights how you've got the vessels being pulled in, and so they're kind of straightened and pulled in. And so you can imagine this would cause distortion of vision, metamorphopsia. And then, of course, here's our, what is this over here? 
OCT, exactly. So look at the little wrinkling on the surface there. So when you see the OCT, you'll see this little wrinkling that's on there. And this is thought to be due to the fact that um, astrocytes, that's another cell that can sometimes live in the retina in small numbers is astrocytes. And once they gain access to the surface of the retina, you know, in front of the um, inner limiting membrane, you can actually get growth right there. And then you'll get this epiretinal membrane starting to form. And again, here's a OCT showing that epiretinal membrane very nicely. And there's the path. Wrinkling on the surface of the retina, so epiretinal membrane. All right, what are we seeing right here? here from this photo, um, there's a lot of, uh, it looked like drusen to me uh, in the maculum stratophobia. Okay, where, where are drusen located pathologically? All right, and this is where we want to talk a little bit. Now, between the RPE and the choroid, there is another structure that has layers. So, what is in between the RPE and the choroid? Uh, Brooks membrane. Brooks membrane. How many layers does Brooks membrane have? Five. Five. And what are they? And how do we remember them? Uh, so there's a, there's a couple of membranes. So this is that sandwich thing. Talked about. Yeah, exactly. The sandwich thing. Yeah, so. so there's there's five. So there's, there's a there's a basal membrane of the RPE, I think. Okay. And there's crap, what makes up the sandwich? So there's that's the bread and then there's uh, meat, turkey. It's turkey. There's the collagen layer. There's a collagen layer, then there's uh, cheese. Cheese. And cheese the is elastic, the elastic the layer. layer. All right, so Brooks is a five layer. So you've got the bread. <laughs> you've got the basement membrane of the RPE and the basement membrane of the chorio capillaris. That's the bread. Then you've got two pieces of cheese. What is cheese? Cheese is elastic. So you've got two elastic layers. And then in the center, you have that really collagenous, you know, thick turkey layer. And so you've got meat, two cheeses, two breads. And so Brooks. And so the point I was getting at here is technically the drusen are underneath the RPE but on top of Brooks. And so technically drusen are actually intra Brooks. So they're under the RPE basement membrane but they're on the surface of Brooks membrane. And so these are these deposits. They're rich in lipofusin. They're really kind of waste products of all the metabolism that's going on in the RPE and eventually they get excreted and they build up in that area. So these are drusen. And here is, you know, we call this a big drusen, you know, giant drusen. And if you can imagine, that's gonna disrupt the RPE overlying it. It's gonna <clears throat> cause areas where the retina degenerates when the RPE on top, you know, underneath that degenerates. And so this is a large drusen. And you can even get more what we call diffuse drusen. So here's a patient with more, you see those are looking bigger, those are larger drusen, they're more diffuse. And you look at the pathology there, this is just a big kind of confluent drusen over here, loss of RPE overlying it. You know, while we're here on the RPE, Brad, mm -hmm. tell me some of the functions of the RPE. So the RPE is responsible for recycling uh, rhodopsin. Okay, so it's, it recycles. It takes the, the deesterified rhodopsin, it gathers it, it reesterifies it, it puts it back up into the outer retina. Mike, another function of the RPE. So they're the, um, the garbage people of the retina, so it takes waste products. And <laughs> yeah, it really does. They kind of process waste products <laughs> Tina, what, what's another function of the RPE? Um, so it provides a barrier. It's like a barrier okay. function. So it is actually the, we call it the outer, you know, blood retinal barrier. And so there's tight junctions in the RPE, and that just keeps fluid from flowing from the choroid into it directly. And so um, one other thing that the RPE does, uh, Catherine. Um, it provides, I think, nutrients. Well, we already kind of said it. It's kind of a waste station. It takes yeah. waste out, puts nutrients in. I'm not sure. Well, the actual pigment. Oh. And so because of the pigment there, it makes it so that you're not 
really light sensitive. And so when you take, say, an albino, really a pure albino, they've got no you know, pigment in their RPE, boy, they're really, really light sensitive. So again, it helps to absorb some of the, the pigment too. All right, now, what are we looking at right here? Temporal macula, I can see um, a pigmented, like hypertrophied scar. Yes, you see a lot of pigment, but look at that kind of macula itself. That looks. There's no clear light reflux. Yeah, so the RPE in this place has been wiped out. What do we call this type of macular degeneration? Geographic atrophy? Exactly, so GA or geographic atrophy. So you can get in an end stage of dry macular degeneration, you get the RPE wiped out, you get so-called geographic atrophy. And here's what it looks like. Here's Brooks. There's a few little cells here, not many, and you look, the RPE is totally wiped out, which means secondarily that the retina gets totally wiped out. So that's so-called geographic atrophy. What are we showing right here? So, um, this is some, there's some sub, uh, retinal as well as sub RPE near vascularization. Um, there, the, there's also a flame shaped hemorrhage there. It's going to be like a 20AMD picture. Exactly. So when you get hemorrhage under the retina, just under the retina itself where it's broken through, it can be red, but when it's under the RPE where near vascularization first starts, it looks kind of greenish grayish. So this is what we call subretinal neo. This is macular degeneration. And then if you look, I copied this out of a book. I just don't have a beautiful picture like this. Here's Brooks. Here's the RP. And look, there's a little break right there. And here's the blood vessels going through that break, growing underneath the RPE here in the retina. So subretinal neovascularization. And that's part of the AMD. And if you don't treat it, you can get this. So huge, again, sub-RPE, sub-retinal hemorrhage, huge here. So we used to laser this, and that's the problem, is when you laser tissue, you actually destroy overlying tissue. So you would use, quote, light laser, and you try to lightly laser it, and obviously that would end up causing, you know, more damage to vision. So now, fortunately, we do have the anti-VEGF injections that we give that can make this regress. And if it doesn't regress, you end up with this, which is a fibrotic, we used to call this a discoform scar, so this gliotic, I should say, gliotic scar underneath the retina from neovascularization bleeding under the retina. What are we seeing right here? So there's some focal areas that look like there's some scarring, um, perhaps uh, some infarct. Uh, and this since they're focal, they're not, I mean, there's some of the macula, but then there's some, off to some of the other vessels, like, so it could be an infectious cause. Okay, hey, what infection looks like this? Exactly. So you see there is a macular component in some of these, but you get these peripheral, they call these punched out lesions, and they actually call this presumed ocular histo, because it's very rare you can actually prove an actual bug in there. So it's presumed ocular histo, but people will have blood tests showing that they had histo, and it's in an area that's endemic to histo. And so peripheral punched out lesions, and then you can get macular lesions and even subretinal neo, a lot like you get in, um, in AMD. All right, so we're looking right here. We've kind of lost our foveal reflex there. It's almost like it's, it's gone, but you look in there and something's just not right. You just don't see a good foveal reflex. What do you think that could be? No. What's a test you want to do when you're looking and you're not seeing a good foveal reflex and you're not quite sure what's going on there? You can do an OCT or you can do this test. All right, so on FA, what is this showing? So this is kind of what they call that flower petal stain in late leakage in the macula. What causes that? Exactly, cystoid macular edema. So remember, it goes into those little cysts of Henle's layer, 
and you get these little flower petal patterns. So this is cystoid macular edema, and that's what it looks like pathologically. Sure enough, we're in the macula. Here's the outer plexiform layer, which we call Henle's here, and you can see the exudate in Henle's. And so anything that causes you know, chronic inflammation in the eyes. You can get it from uveitis, you can get it after cataract surgery, and so this is cystoid macular edema. All right, what are we seeing right here? Kind of a funny looking macula. Yeah, so <clears throat> again, we really have a pretty poor foveal reflex. Uh, we don't see anything there, and uh, it just looks... Kind Wait, of that weird. picture is not this picture. I mean, I know that sounds funny, but, but you, come, you have to come around here for a minute. Come look at this picture right here. It, make a road trip, come around here, because no, seriously, because that, that doesn't show it well. Get it right. You guys can all come around if you want. I mean, this is definitely not. See, look, that's that oh, picture's yeah. not that. No, that's not. It really isn't. So it's not even fair. But but please take a look at that. I don't know why that's. Mm. So what are we looking at there now? So looking at it here, it looks more kind of like a bullseye. Maculopathy. Exactly. This is a bullseye maculopathy. So you can't see it when you look up there because it's all kind of washed out. So this is a bullseye maculopathy. What what are some of the causes of bullseye maculopathies? Um, so the big one we worry about is plaquenil toxicity. Right, so we look at a lot of patients in clinic with hydroxychloroquine, plaquenil, you worry about it now. You want to catch it before it gets to this point, because by this time there's some permanent damage done. So usually it's medication. Some of the antipsychotics can do this, uh, plaquenil can do this, and so bullseye may come up. You, know, you can get a bullseye appearance in some of the, the cone rod dystrophies too, but this is kind of an end stage. Uh, bullseye. This was a plaquenil patient. When you look at the fluorescein, instead of leakage, you actually get window defects here. So it, it doesn't like get bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. These are actually window defects. So you can see the dark area around it, and this is actually the choroid shining through. So this is a bullseye maculopathy. All right, I'm sorry, we'll have to go quickly here. What is this entity here? Um, this is... These are angioid streaks. Exactly, so these are angioid streaks, and they are actually under the retina. In what layer? Uh, the choroid. Cor cor no, not yet. they're actually in Brooks. Oh, okay. So you get a brittle Brooks, and you get these little focal <clears throat> breaks in Brooks angioid. Why would I be showing you this lady's neck? You're associated with chicken skin. Exactly, <laughs> the chicken skin from Pseudoxanthoma elasticum. This is a so-called pluck chicken look. So angioid streaks, you can sometimes also get them even in sickle cell, too. But angioid streaks, pseudosensoma, elasticum. What are we looking at right here? Um, oh, so this is, color finest photo, the nerve looks, uh, has some pallor to it. Pale nerve? The uh, vessels are attenuated. Really or, attenuated vessels. And then and you have pigment clumping, so this looks like RP. Exactly, so this is retinitis pigmentosa. And here's a close-up. Now, why do you get this bony spicule pattern to the pigment? Um, you know, I, I don't know. Actually, the pigment gets released from the RPE, which gets chewed up, and then it'll kind of diffuse around to the vessels. It'll deposit around the vessels, and that's why you get that bony spicule pattern. And here you can see chewed up RPE, pigment going up into the retina along the vessels, so you get the bony spicule pattern, but if you, they call this chalky white pallor of the disc, attenuated arterioles. All right, what the heck is this thing? Oh, it's like a, we're looking at, like central retina phobia, um, uh, almost like, they call it like an egg deposit, like an egg shape. Okay, so what disease gives you this? This would be my brain. Um, not starter. It's um, this is best, uh, sorry, best disease. This is the only time you ever do an EOG. I don't think I've ever done that in my career, but this EOG. And so you get this deposition of this material underneath. Now uh, in kids they call it best. Sometimes in adults they call it adult vitelliform dystrophy. And you get this deposition of this material. Again, kind of underneath the RP. Now, surprisingly, they can have that big sunny side up egg in the middle of their fovea and still have like 20, 40, 20, 50 vision. So it looks really dramatic, but they can still have pretty good vision. 
All right, what are we looking at right here? Um, you have some um, yellow appearing flecks kind of radiating out from the macula. Um, See, this is where you have to be imaginative. And I always say that the pathologist of sniff formalin, but I don't know what the retinologist's excuse is because fluorescein doesn't do anything to your brain. So they call this pisiform or fish-like. And so this is actually, if it affects the macula, it's called Stargardt syndrome. If it's peripheral, they call it fundus flavi maculatus. And so you get these little deposits and these little fish-like entities there. And, and the material is actually lipofusin. So you get lipofusin deposited in the RPE cells. And this is Stargardt's. And last but not least, and this is not a blurry picture. This okay, is it's in focus. Very easy to use. I think either blood or detritus. Okay. And This is actually an acute infection. This is the so-called headlight in the fog, and this is toxo. So toxo is a, you know, chorioretinitis. It's a retinitis, actually, and then it spills into the vitreous. And so acute toxo, you get a headlight in the fog, but chronic toxo, you get one of these burned out scars. There's all these lacunae with this white sclera showing through and the broken up pigment. So this is where you had a toxo infection. And this is often congenital. You know, you get it from uncooked meats and can even be passed on from the mom in, you know, intrauteral and you get these little toxo cysts here in the peripheral retina. And this just shows you an area where you had some RPE here and retina here, but then you come over here, the RPE and the retina get wiped out by the chronic toxo. And last but not least, Exudate, ischemia, what is the classic one for this? CMV. CMV, and so cytomegalovirus, and when we, when unfortunately HIV was really exploding and we couldn't treat it well, you would get a ton of this, this CMV retinitis, and you actually get in the ganglion cells and the retina, you get intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions. So you get these inclusions um, in there, and then we say goodbye to Vienna. Next week is going to be optic nerve, so please study up your optic nerve, okay?